welcome to the 15th annual kickoff event for One Book, One Region. I'm Betty Ann Ryder, director of the Groton Public Library and one of the founding members of the committee. I'm both happy and somewhat surprised to be standing here celebrating 15 years of our community reading project. This is a group effort that joins public libraries with high school and college students, book clubs, and interested readers throughout the region. One Book, One Region would not exist without our generous sponsors. Connecticut College has once again stepped up. They are the best partners ever, and they will be hosting our author when she joins us in September. Tracy Reiser has been our primary contact at the college. She is Connecticut College's yeah. <laughs> Tracy serves as Connecticut College's Associate Dean of Community Learning, Associate Director of the Holleran Center for Community Action and Public Policy, and Director of Community Partnerships. Tracy has taken on the One Book Project and given it a new life. Her connections, enthusiasm, dedication, and love of the region is unsurpassed, and she will be greatly missed when she retires later this month. The good news is that she's not retiring from her role with one book. Um, she has agreed to continue working with us, and for that, I am very grateful. <laughs> I also want to thank Connecticut Humanities for their support of the author visit as part of their series at issue, The Legacy of Race and Ethnicity in Connecticut. This series is sponsored by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and includes a variety of programs that are taking place in four other cities around Connecticut. And I want to welcome um, Helen Higgins, who is their director, who is with us tonight. We also have private foundations who have asked to remain nameless who are supporting our project. And they know who they are, and we thank them. <laughs> After 15 years, you may be wondering how this project got started. Back in 2002, uh, Steve Slosberg, who many of you may remember as a columnist at the day, wrote a column asking why Southeastern Connecticut couldn't have a community reading project. They were just becoming popular in other cities around the country. At that time, the Groton Library was sponsoring a project that had every fifth through eighth grader reading the same book. So this seemed like it was the next step. Um, we hosted a meeting of local libraries, schools, and interested community members, and before long, the first One Book, One Region project was unveiled. Our first book was Snow in August by Pete Hamill. And since then, our choices have included fiction and nonfiction on topics as varied as immigration, the Holocaust, justice, and bullying. We've explored Nepal, Afghanistan, Haiti, colonial America, the Atlantic Ocean, and a variety of other settings around the world. This year's book, Homegoing by Yah Jesse, was a unanimous choice. And yes, I have researched how you pronounce her name, and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, Jesse's uh, debut novel traces the impact of the slave trade through generations of a single family and contemplates the consequences of human trafficking on both sides of the Atlantic by weaving the stories of the descendants on one side of the family in the United States through slavery, reconstruction, the Great Migration, Harlem Renaissance, civil rights, with the history of the family left behind in Ghana, dealing with the effects of British colonialism, West Africa's role in the transatlantic slave trade, and inter-kingdom inter rivalries. All I can say is that I was left wanting to know more about each of these characters and their families. I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. We would not be here this evening, as I said, without the support of Connecticut College, and it is my pleasure to introduce Jefferson Singer to talk about our collaboration. Jefferson is the Connecticut College Falk Foundation Professor of Psychology and Dean of the College. Professor Singer completed his undergraduate work at Amherst College and earned his PhD at Yale University. He joined Connecticut College in 1988. He's the former director of Conn College's Holleran Center for Community Action and Public Policy, which has a focus on the development of active citizenship and leadership. Professor Singer is the recipient of the Fulbright Distinguished Scholar Award, and he is also a great supporter of One Book, One Region, and has been instrumental in bringing our program to the campus. So Jefferson. Thank you very much, Betty, and thank you to the One Book, One Region Committee um, for making another great selection and partnering with uh, Connecticut College on uh, this choice. 
I wanted to say a little bit about why we are so excited about uh, home going as the selection for One Book, One Region, and now also the selection for Connecticut College's summer reading um, book, which means that all incoming students will be reading the book and discussing the book in their first year seminars and with their um, first year advisors and their student advisors and other members of the Connecticut College community. You can imagine how nicely this will all dovetail when the students who have been talking about the book, thinking about the book, have the opportunity on September 27th to actually see the author in the, in the flesh and to ask questions of, of uh, yeah, Jesse at that time. So we, we are ecstatic about this synergy that's happening and, and I want to make sure that all community members uh, in New London County feel welcome at Connecticut College to come that evening and, and uh, there'll be ample parking and, and we'll have signs and we'll try to make it as, as uh, accessible and comfortable for all of you as, as possible. Uh, I want to say something about the selection of, of home going because even though we knew that One Book, One Region had selected the book, we couldn't just impose it because we have at Connecticut College, we call it shared governance. We, we have to have make sure that everyone has some buy-in to what we do. So we couldn't just say, okay, this is going to be the book. We had to do it in a way that would be more democratic. So what we did was we asked students to uh, take a look at a variety of different possibilities. Um, and we first started by having them nominate books that they thought would be great summer reading books. And Homegoing was one of those that was included in the uh, nominations. After we did that, we asked uh, a group of uh, students to volunteer over the winter break to read the selections that we had about a half dozen. And we bought the books for them, and we bought multiple copies. And we gave out as many books of the, of the possible selections that we could um, to students to read them over uh, winter break. The students then uh, reviewed the books and gave us their ratings of what books they would uh, want to select. And when it all came down uh, to the ending point, uh, Homegoing was selected by students, staff, and faculty as the book that we wanted to choose. And so we felt that we had both the right book to uh, connect with, One Book, One Region, but we also had a book that had buy-in from our community. So we're, we're absolutely thrilled about that. And I wanted to show you uh, the way the students received the, the book because it then relates to something that I, I want to say and then I'll wrap up about the theme of the book. So all the students, the incoming students, will have received now in the mail, we put it out in the last week or so, so that by now they should have received it, this very attractive mailer that says, begin your journey home on it. And then when they open it up, there's a, a letter from the president of Connecticut College, Catherine, Catherine Bergeron, about home going and encouraging them to read the book this summer and, and that they'll have the opportunity to write a small essay about it and discuss it with their advisor. So they get the book, there's the, the book. They also get a survival guide called Over the Hump of how to get through their lives at Connecticut College. Um, but what I want to emphasize about their getting the book, and we have a, a, a website that accompanies the book as well, that, that links to the One Book, One Region website, which if you haven't visited yet, you, you ought to take a look at, um, because it's filled with upcoming events and, and resources uh, around home going. But what we try, what we're emphasizing for the book is the idea of, um, the, of home and then the, the related question, where are you from? Because that's the first question that everyone asks when you're a first year student of your fellow first year students, where are you from? Well, we want them to think about that question at a much more deeper level than uh, simply what state are you from, but how is your background, how is your ancestry, how have the generations that have molded you affected you to be the person that you are, and how can I learn about you and learn about myself from inquiring more deeply into that question of where are you from? So we think we have a way of finding a, a a, uh, a starting point for dialogue and conversation among our first year students where maybe they can take some risks in learning about where people that are very different from themselves are from and what that means to them and what the con consequences of their particular historical backgrounds have meant for their arrival at Connecticut College. And maybe they've come from very divergent um, past, but now they're at a common place and how can they learn to find some common community and connection from doing that. So homegoing, even though it's about uh, people from, uh, in some cases, many centuries before, about people from a continent very far from the United States, 
we think it actually can be a galvanizing um, point for our students in finding a convergence in a way of, of connecting with each other. So that's our goal with using this as our summer reading. I hope it can be a goal for One Book, One Region in, in general as a way for all community members to think about the question of where am I from and how does, how does that affect what I choose and do in my life now? How does it affect my relationships with the other people that are part of my community? So I'll stop there and I know we have um, some very fine words to, pro to progress for forward. Thank you very much. My book is titled Homegoing. It is a novel that traces the family lineage of two half-sisters. The first half-sister, um, Afia, is the wife of the British governor of the Cape Coast Castle, which is a slave castle in Ghana. And the second half-sister, Essie, is kept in the castle as a slave before being sent to America. And each chapter deals with a different descendant and toggles back and forth between the American side of the family and the Ghanaian side of the family. So the character Marjorie feels as though she doesn't belong either in Ghana or in Alabama, um, which is similar to how I felt growing up. I was born in Ghana in 1989 in a town called Mampol, which is in the Ashanti region. I grew up all over. I lived first in Ohio and then we moved to Illinois, and then Tennessee, and then Alabama. When I left my house and you know went out into the rest of America, I wasn't American enough for America, but I also wasn't quite Ghanaian enough for Ghana whenever I was there. And so I think a lot of my, my childhood was spent trying to figure out where I fit in. And this book stemmed from, from trying to figure that out. I think I started to realize later on in life that there is actually a lot that connects us. Um, and I wanted to explore what that was. And the very beginning of that is, is our time in Africa. I first got the idea of, for this book in 2009 when I was traveling to Ghana. I visited the Cape Coast Castle, which is a slave castle. Various ethnic groups would, would capture people during wars or sometimes they would would just um, be sold to them and then they would take them down to to the the coast and sell them to the British particularly um, for those of us who are from West African countries that were involved in the slave trade um, who now live in America and are kind of in constant contact with with what the result of, of that um, trade was I think you can you can make that link I could have been I could have been American. One thing that I had always wanted for this book was that by the time you got to the end of it, you couldn't say that you didn't understand, you know, why black people in America are the way they are, or why they might feel the things that they feel. You know, you get to see exactly what steps have led to the current state of racial tension in America. And just to see that every moment has this, um, has this footprint. So nothing you do in, in history just like goes away or disappears. It has an effect on every other generation that comes, that comes after yours. So we are going to meet that amazing person on September 27th at Palmer Auditorium, Connecticut College. And we are deeply moved, or you will be deeply moved, by reading this extraordinary novel, Homegoing. I am Tracy Reiser, Senior Associate Dean for Community Partnerships at Connecticut College. And I have the distinct honor of introducing Professor Henrietta Bala. Professor Bala joined Connecticut College in August of 2016 and teaches in our history department. She earned her BA at Pennsylvania State University and her MA and PhD at Ohio State University. Professor Bala's areas of specialization include 19th and 20th century Africa, the Atlantic world, civil wars, youth history, labor and social movements, and women's history. Professor Bala's scholarly research and teaching focus on, quote, bottom-up history, meaning an emphasis on the ideas and methods of ordinary people dealing with complex issues within their particular historical moments. 
Emphasis on the grassroots will continue to inform her course content, historical methods, and pedagogical goals. She teaches courses on pre-colonial Africa, colonial Africa, youth and social movements in Africa, and African women. She is also developing several new courses, including the history of terrorism in Africa, civil wars and African societies, and Islam in Africa. Professor Bala's research has been presented at numerous conferences, both domestic and international, including the annual African Studies Association Conference at the University of Liberia, West Africa. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Professor Bala. Well, thank you, Tracy, for that very warm welcome, and also to Jeff for asking me to review the book on behalf of the college. And of course, to all of you for being here. It is with great pleasure and delight that I introduce to you this year read for the One Region, One Book and the Connecticut College Summer Read Program, Homegoing by Yah Jesse. You have already seen the clip that was shown, and I'm sure some of you have already read the book. But for those of us who haven't read the book, I'm going to do everything I can not to spoil it. <laughs> because just like our author, I too am an immigrant. I'm originally from Liberia. And one of the first things I learned in America, you never tell anyone who have not seen the movie what the movie is about. <laughs> I learned that the highway in college. When I came back, you know, like, did you? No, no, don't spoil it. So I'll make sure that whatever I say tonight will not ruin the book. So what I hope to achieve today is to provide a historical context um, for the novel that I hope will enhance your reading experience. There are many themes in the book. Some of you have already read it, and if I was to take a little poll in the room to say, well, tell me about some of the themes, I'm sure there will be a lot of people would throw out there. So what I hope today is to just comment on couples that I think is imperative to understanding the context of this novel. So I have identified three. As I said, there are many. So scholars, we're very cognizant of saying, well, you say it was three. No, no, there are many. This is just three that I think are important um, for us to understand this um, text. And the first one is the transatlantic slave trade, which of course lasted from the 16th to of course the 19th um, century. In fact, the first group of slaves were brought over in 1532 to the Americas, not the United States, right? We often use what 1619 as the, the mark for the United States. And so the entire book um, is shaped by this most inhumane trade. And so the two main characters, Ifia and Issy, the two half-sisters, their lives and their descendants' lives are shaped and reshaped, if you will, by this experience. And it helped us, this whole transatlantic slave trade, as it pertains to the book, help us to understand how geography, race, um, ethnicity, class, gender, help to shape and reshape our identity. Um, everybody reading this book can find something in it to connect. You, you don't have to be from Africa or of African descent to feel some kind of connection to the text. And that was one of the things I appreciated um, about it. So even pertaining to gender, a male, both male and female, or even a transgender person who identified as something in this book. And I think that's one of the things the author does effectively that we can all connect with. I mean, you don't have to be from another place, but how many of you have moved from another city or another state to come to Connecticut? I just moved from Ohio, right? after 12 years uh, there to Connecticut. Definitely there are culture changes and constant navigation. So it's not just people of color who have to navigate things. White folks have to too. And we deal with all of these things in our own ways. And so I think that's one of the things I really appreciated um, about um, JC's um, work that I think you also, or I hope you will also appreciate. So in terms of the Gold Coast with the um, slave trade, as Ghana was then known then, I want to emphasize to you all that Ghana was not the only region that slaves came from. In fact, there were six key regions of the transatlantic slave trade. Ghana was just one 
of the, the prominent. We have the Bright of Biafra, which is, of course, Nigeria areas, the Windward Coast, Liberia, Sierra Leone. We had a lot of those. And again, different parts of the US and also the Americas desire slaves from certain regions. And in fact, the slaves that were brought, only 5% was brought to the US. 45% went to Brazil. The US, yes. Yes, the US. A lot of what happened with the US was this internal slave trade, if you will. So where people often think about just the transatlantic slavery, but there was a whole big internal slave trade and slave market here. And in the beginning, one thing to connect to what our author said about women, this issue of gender, in the beginning, women were not a major component of slaves brought over. It was men. When it became issue of scarcity, became, then they started to what, bring women in. In the beginning, women were not the primary um, commodity. And I'm using the word commodity to historicize it. But, and essentially, those were what slaves were. They were commodities. Um, they were not humans, as we will already know. And so I just have some images that I want to show you of, so that when you read in the book, when she talks about the dungeon and describing things, you will have some visualization in your head of what it is she's talking about. So please just indulge me a little bit here. So one of the first images I am, hope can everybody see this? Fantastic. Oftentimes I'll have a student who will say, no, 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 lower the light, I can't see, turn the light, you know? So I just wanna make sure. So this is a slave holding cell at the Amina Castle, one of the very um, place that she described. This is essentially was a dungeon. So here you can see there are no windows, <clears throat> excuse me, there are no windows, no doors, and slaves will be packed up in here for a couple of months, waiting for the slave sh ship to arrive to take them over. So when you hear about the Middle Passage, that's the experience of enslaved people from the moment they were captured in Africa to, of course, um, the moment they arrive on the slave markets in the US. And the issue of slavery is more complex than just you know people selling. Pe Africans did not quote unquote sell their own. It was ethnic groups against ethnic groups, right? People did not identify at one. So that's one thing we need to be clear of. It was not, how could Africans sell their own people? They were not their own people. They were they, what they had in common with their race. But people identify in terms of their ethnic group, this idea of African is a colonial invention. And so that's one thing that's often left out of this historicization. And so they'll be stacking here for a while and maybe two or three months. And then when the ship came, they were taken. So very, very um, horrific. Another image here I want to show you is the gate of no return. Now, after being housed in what we just saw in the dungeon for a couple of months, once the ship came, they will line up and they will go through this gate of this gate. And it was called the gate of no return because what did that signal? You were leaving for the new world. That was it. You won't be coming back. So that's why um, it was called um, that. Oops. And another gate of no return here is of course Gori in Senegal. <laughs> and you can see up where you see the steps and stuff, administrative stuff will be done in there. And some of these castles, they were not built specifically for the slave trade. They were built for what? For trade. Because before Europeans started trading in humans, they were trading other commodities with Africans. Um, it wasn't the beginning of trade or contact with Africans. And so um, other administrative stuff and other trade was going on in there. And here, I just want to show you, this is like the Amina Castle that was built, of course, in 1482 by the Portuguese. The Portuguese were one of the first group to explore a lot of West Africa and will become central in the transatlantic slave trade. And so that's the Amina Castle. And here, this is part of the Atlantic Ocean. So once they came out, what did they see out of that door? You just saw the water. You just saw the water. So you can just imagine. So I hope these images as you're reading and she's describing some of those scenes will give you an idea of what it must have been. Not, we can't really identify with it, but you know, hopefully it will help you um, some. And then <clears throat> another theme in the story that I think is integral to helping us understand uh, what 
um, ya was attempting to do is the centrality of indigenous cultural identities. And what I mean by that is, for example, the names of the characters in the book. We have Ifia, we have Esi, we have Kwabina, Kofi, Kojo. All of those names are indigenous names. Ya herself, the name Ya, it's a Fanti name. We're talking specifically about the Fanti and the Ashantis here. Now, an interesting thing about Fanti's and Shanti, Ashanti's names is that children are given their names based on the day of the week they were born. So our author, Ya, she was born on the Thursday. Yes. So when I was asked to review the book, as soon as I saw Ya, I said, oh, she was born on Thursday. Um, and the male, her male counterpart would be Yao. The boy would be Yao. So Ifia, one of our characters, she was born on a Friday. So I think one of the things that um, our author is doing here is this, even the title, Home Going, is this business about going back and reclaiming. There is this symbol in the Akan tradition called Sankofa, go back and reclaim it. So I think our author is actively engaging in that with some of these names that she is using for these characters. And another thing that I thought part of this centrality of indigenous culture identity is the use of proverbs. When you open the book right away, there is a proverb. Now, what's the centrality of the proverb? In fact, she starts one of the pr proverbs as saying, Abosia tese aqua. The family is like a forest. Right? So why is this central? Why am I mentioning this? And she goes on to say each person has a role to play. It's important because child rearing practices in a lot of African society, your parents, I remember growing up, if I did something wrong, my grandmother or my mother never said, you did X, Y, and Z wrong. One, you got the eye, and you knew something was wrong. Or two, you had a saying, you had a proverb said to you, and you understood exactly what was going on here. So I think the use of the proverb here at the beginning is to emphasize what is about to happen in the story too. That something, each family standing on its own, um, that, that there is about to be some transformations here, things that are going to take place here that will expect one to, to, to prepare him or herself for. And so as I read this text, I read it not only as a scholar, but I read it as um, an African, a Liberian woman and also as somebody who is familiar with the Ghanaian culture. And I want to conclude by saying this, and hopefully there are questions um, that I hopefully can add, um, answer for you. I just wanted to emphasize that the using of names based on the days of the week is not quote unquote African, <laughs> right? This is what, unique to the Fanti and the Ashantis. In Ghana, there are 48 different ethnic groups. Yes, no kidding. And with those groups come 48 different languages besides English. And so besides those two groups, the Fantis and the Ashantis, all of the other groups do not use the day of the week to um, name their children. For example, my spouse is a gun. And with the gun, they have lineages name. So I have a daughter, and her name is Nade because she's the first daughter. And my son is Kote because he's the first boy. And my husband is Nijani because he's the third boy. So based on your names, people can identify where you're from. And so it also forces you to behave, right? Because if someone says, what, what's your name? And you answer and you're misbehaving, it gets back to your family. <laughs> it's like, well, X said you were misbehaving and stuff. And so I had a great appreciation for our author using some of these things that I think um, in, her, in her own way, as she talked about her own identity as an immigrant woman, um, here you see her effort at reclaiming some of that. And so with that, um, I will conclude and ask if you have any questions or comments for me. Yes, sir. The huge percentage of, of the slaves, uh -huh. I believe, that went to Brazil, uh -huh. There. Very, very good. So Brazil, what was happening at that time that even became the foundation for the transatlantic slave trade. One of the things we knew about Brazil had very, in the Biafra, um, um, Bihar, excuse me, region was that it was very fertile in Fokino soil, so it was great for sugarcane 
for growing sugarcane. So a lot of those slaves was used for the production of sugarcane. Because we don't think now all the doctors tell you, you know, wash your sugar, you know, all of this stuff. But back in the day, no one was washing their sugar. It was the huge economy. Yes, the Portuguese, because they use Sao Tome and Principe. These are these two tiny islands off West Africa. And they set up um, sugarcane plantation there and experimented with that. And that became part of the model for um, plantation slavery in um, the Americas. Yes. With that, I was just thinking um, so much of our culture is related to food. Mm -hmm. How that transition happens from Africa to the United States. Very, very good. So in the text, uh, for example, you see that Yah describes the saying, I don't want to give it away, spoiler alert, right? Like, but there is a saying where somebody is making bankun, B-A-N-K-U, that's one of the local food, right? And uh, bankun, when I read that, and I was like, oh my gosh, she's talking about Banco, I just made some. Um, yeah. Um, so it's very, very important. You see, when slaves came over, they did not, quote unquote, forget Africa. So there are issues of continuity and discontinuity. And so, for example, not to stereotype, but fried chicken, a lot of what we call southern food. If you go to places like Liberia, where I've invited someone over to my house once for dinner, she was like, this is like I'm in the South. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So people brought over with them. So there is this definite continuity. And one way we do that is through food, it's dress, it's music. It's, it's in so many ways. But those things did not discontinue, although some scholars argued that you know everything that was created was new and there was no element of African, Ira Berlin, for example, one of the scholars who argued that. But there have been others who have argued, like Walter Rutgers and Jason Young, that actually there were continuities. And we see it even in black spirituals and so forth. So absolutely, continuity um, was a factor. Oh, oh, good. OK, yes. This is great. Lots of questions. Yes, sir. So you're from Liberia. I Did, am. Are you a descendant of slaves that were sent uh -huh. back to Liberia from the United States? <laughs> Yes, I am. My folks came over in 1817 from Windsor, North Carolina. So we have all the records and the pictures and stuff. So yes, yes. Talk about home going, right? <laughs> like, yes, yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know why I didn't even think about it, but I was very surprised how many people were shocked that the black groups, ethnic groups, were selling others from Africa to the slavers. I mean, it just seemed to me there could have been a little more unity that couldn't have happened, but same thing in America with the American. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, and I just want to say thank you for being so brave to say that, because oftentimes, even in my classes, students will be like, Professor Bala, I, I just don't understand why Africans enslave their own people. I just can't fathom. And I said, well, this is great. Class is going to be great, because we're going to deconstruct that, right? So this idea about identity formation, um, prior to colonialism with the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885, what we call Africans, people did not identify on their race to say, you know, just like we don't say, oh, Europeans, those white people enslaved their own people. How could they have done that, right? Um, well, what they had in common was their race. But people, pre-colonially in Africa, people identify in terms of their ethnic group. And what was happening right um, before the transatlantic slave trade? Well, there were a lot of state formation happening across Africa. So um, people were fighting, groups were fighting against each other. We shouldn't be surprised. That's human nature if we look at Europe, people have fought against each other. So again, if you were Fonti, you did not, you could care less about what was happening with the guns. You could care less because you're trying to form your state, you're trying to be stronger. If you did not defeat them and they defeated you, well, you could be what sold into slavery. And this issue of slavery also, for the sake of time, I will just quickly say this, this issue of slavery also, Slavery existed in Africa before the transatlantic slave trade as everywhere else. Now, 
there were variation. There is no such thing as a good slave, a good slavery. But what did we have? Slave could own other slave. They could marry. It was not the same as chattel slavery. And in fact, one of the Europeans um, classified as slavery in Africa was indentured servants. They were ignorant of African cultures and society and just assumed everything they saw there was the same. Now, does that, does that excuse um, people from participating in this inhumane trade? I think the focus ought to be how could people, human beings in general, regardless of one's race, how could human beings do this to each other? Not as your own, but just based on our sheer humanity. Like, because when we put it within that context, we are better able to understand. This was a trade that lasted over 200 years. It was profitable. It was profitable. So how could humans do this to each other? I think that helps us better understand. And in, 16, in the early 1600s, one of the African kings of Dahomey, the king of Dahomey, Martin de Beni, he argued for the trade to be stopped. But the Europeans needed labor so much in the New World that they were supplying weapons to African groups, instigating conflict so that they could generate more slaves. Yes, and so even if you look at colonization, this, when they wanted to colonize Africa, when, they did, when slavery was no longer viable, what did they do? They stopped trading weapons to Africans and went to war with them and colonized them. So there was the African component but at the same time, there is this Western component. There was another question, and then. On a lighter note, <laughs> um, I appreciate the question about food. Would, um, do you recommend any good Ghanaian or good Liberian restaurants in the end? Oh. <laughs> Hi, well, I just invite you to my house. <laughs> invite you over for Liberian and Ghanaian dishes. Like, I, I'm serious. That's a true offer. There aren't any local ones. Well, when I got here, I looked. I mean, the closest African grocery store is in Providence. It's 45 minutes. So I'm planning this weekend to, I was like, okay, I'm going to make the trek. Um, so I'll give you my information, and we can, you know, pick a day, and you can come over for some good Liberian and Ghanaian food, but you're not going to find it locally. <laughs> Just two quick questions. Um, the word race did not appear in the English language until 1508. Mm -hmm. And you can explain a little bit as to what was the meaning of race in the beginning and how it became a social construct mm -hmm. within, our, um, within our English language. Mm -hmm. And also the second question is, 1884-1885, as you and I both know, Bismarck Conference in Germany mm -hmm. that took place with the 54 countries cutting up Africa. Mm -hmm. And what was the significance of 1884-1885 in all the European nations? came together at that conference in Germany, and how did that trickle into like what exactly is impact, how it impacted Africa today? Mm -hmm. Very, very good. So the first part of the, um, your question about this issue of race, if you look at, since we're talking about Ghana, if you look at a lot of the indigenous languages, there is no term for race. This issue, it's a race as we know, is a social construct, as with a lot of stuff. So if you look at the indigenous languages, you will not find those concepts. You will find concept of, 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 of ethnicity in terms of, of responsibility to one lineage and stuff. So this idea of race, let's, let's look at Africa. This idea of race became codified as a colonial, as a, I would argue essentially around the trans, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. Because if you look prior to the 1500s, Europeans' representation of Africa was on equal terms with Europe. In fact, West African gold was used to in the coinage of Roman um, coins. So their representation, their construction of Africa was on that same level. When the need for slaves came, then we had this racial construct. So using the Bible, the hermetic myth, to justify enslavement. So we started to see this racial con uh, construct around that time as it pertains to Africa. But it really have no significance. When I'm back in Liberia or Ghana, if you ask me you know, who I am, I don't say, oh, I'm Liberian, I'm African. People would not tell you they're that they're there. So a lot of that has been this new construct. Now, to the second part of your question about the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885. 
Why did the conference take place in the first place? We know that in a, um, 1805, the Danish were the first to abolish their participation in the transatlantic slave trade, followed by the British in 1807 and the US in 1808. Now, why did the British end it? Because of the British Industrial Revolution. You don't need manpower anymore. You need what? Now you have machines. What do you need from Africa? You need raw materials. You need people to stay on the continent and to produce. So the significance of that conference was the turning point from the trade in human beings to now the trade in what, quote unquote, what they call legitimate commerce. So now we trade in goods and services. So that switch came to alter Africa because now raw materials, so you grow in, we're talking about cotton, coffee, um, palm nuts, ground nuts, all of those things transform African society because even if we look at gender, African women were excluded because it was this Victorian ideology of womanhood, that a woman's place was in the home. Well, in pre-colonial Africa, we have stuff like the dual sex political system. Women were powerful. They were queen mothers, they were in government, they participated in politics. But we see with colonialism that all of that, and what has happened with colonialism? If you subscribe to the ideas of Walter Romney, for example, that Europe underdeveloped Africa, not just with the transatlantic slave trade, but with colonialism, with this gross massive exploitation, and you still see that today in Africa. Go to Ghana, for example, since we're talking about Ghana within this context. Look at all the mass um, Chinese corporation, Western corporation, all over the place. A lot of the local people have been displaced, not just in Ghana, but across Africa. The World Bank, the IMF, Structural Adjustment Program, it goes on and on. So Europe, the West, have been very detrimental to Africa. Africa is the richest continent in the world in terms of resources, but yet it is the poorest per human capital. Yes. You're very welcome. Can you give me a book list? Can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to. One of the big ones that I'll just recommend that I think takes you from pre-colonial to the modern time that I use in my course right now is Gilbert and Randall's. Um, and I'm recommending that one. It's a textbook, but it, because it's one of the leading ones right now, they got a lot of stuff in there right. So Africa, prehistoric, um, prehistoric to modern times. So that will be one, it will give you a lot, but I can give you a lot of other books. Walter Rani, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Um, Jason's Young, um, um, Walter Rucker. Um, I mean, there are tons and tons, uh, but if you start with Gilbert and Reynolds, it will be a good place for you to start. And if any of you are interested, I will gladly send you my syllabus for my course, and there are articles and stuff you can, yes. That was exactly my question. I'm a white European woman <laughs> teaching to a bunch of white college students, and one book, one region always challenges me, but this one, like, I'm floored. I, I just don't have the background that I need, so. Abdu Bwahin is another one. Abdu, A-D-U, is the first name, B-O-E-H-A-N, Abdu Bwahin. Um, he, he's, He's good. Yes. Can I make a suggestion that we, in the One Book, One Region um, website, we can put some of the... We were, we were just talking about that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Nice. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes. Will you be um, speaking again any time during the One Book, One Region? <laughs> no, I won't be speaking. <laughs> Oh, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm doing some research. <laughs> yes. Pardon? I wish I were a Connecticut college student. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll be happy to share whatever it is. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, so uh, please check our calendar of events often. Uh, we have a website. It's just onebookoneregion.org. 
and we are already planning some exciting programs. We have, uh, some of them are out uh, on a, a flyer out front that you can pick up. Um, and we hope that you'll join us to share your insights once you've read Home Going. Um, books are available for purchase this evening from another one of our longtime partners, Bank Square Books. Um, please enjoy the book, the library programs, the book discussions over the summer months, and we'll see you on September 27th at Connecticut College, where we invite you to bring your friends and your neighbors and to meet Yah Jesse. Uh, see you then.